Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. Win lots of money at the casino? I learned the hard way not to play blackjack with a bunch of data scientists last night, so. <laughs> well, welcome to the talk today. Uh, my name is Philip Lebo. I'm going to talk about Gap Inc.'s cloud migration, how we use PCF, some of the things that we learned, um, and some things didn't work out so well. <clears throat> so I'm just a director in the architecture practice uh, at Gap, I'm primarily responsible for price optimization. Some of you may have seen my other talk about um, price optimization, how we use PCF in a multi-cloud environment to basically optimize prices for what we need. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about patterns, tools, and techniques. Um, and at the end, I have just a couple, but we do have a friends and family event at Gap. So I have a couple of discount coupons. So if you guys want one, just come up. Uh, I don't have too many, so if you want one, just come on up. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about patterns, tools, and techniques, challenges, next step, and some questions. Um, if you guys have any questions, though, feel free to raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> apologize, I got a little bit of a cold. So the first thing I think that was a big change for Gap was this concept of microservices and things that are rapidly deployed <clears throat> um, automatically through a Fed CI, what we call a federated CI pipeline. Uh, that was a big change for us. And it required a lot of uh, change in our existing infrastructure. Uh, we had sort of a, a precursor to Spring Boot, something called, we called the Service Harness that was developed by a consulting company. It was pretty, pretty poorly done, to be very frank with you. And getting off of that was a big challenge for us and still continues to be a challenge. But Spring Boot, as you can imagine, is what we're targeting um, for our deployment and services infrastructure. But developers have loved Cloud Foundry. They love the idea of being able just to automatically check your code in, run some tests, and flow it all the way into production. Now, in our environment, you know, we kind of put a, we put a stop at the end. We do have someone to click the button. We don't automatically flow stuff through to production. Um, I think, and it's very interesting that we've reached a state in our history where we can deploy changes faster than people can actually really um, consume them. So, for example, you don't want to walk in one morning and your UI is completely changed because someone thought, wow, that's a great idea. You know, so we do have a little bit of control there. Um, but that was, that was a big change for Gap. Um, and now we're really able to push changes through very, very rapidly. One of the other things that we've um, started to use heavily is RabbitMQ. And I, I found that newer developers aren't really familiar with this pattern. And we've really used this to great effect to achieve horizontal scalability. So in the, the project that I mentioned earlier, when we optimize prices for a lot of our clothing, you know, that's a very sophisticated optimization problem. And we use RabbitMQ to essentially queue up all of the work tasks and move through them. Now this can take, we basically have 6,000 optimization problems that we need to solve in about four hours. And the nice thing about Cloud Foundry is that if we're not meeting that SLA or we're in danger of missing it, we can automatically scale that. And you know, the, I'll talk a little bit about scale, um, auto scaling a little bit later, um, some of the things that I would like to see from a platform point of view. Um, but this was a change for some of our newer developers to think about parallelism from the get-go and to not put it in as an afterthought. Uh, but it's been very effective for us. And in fact, in our environment, <clears throat> it took us a little while to get Cloud Foundry installed. So we actually set up Rabbit uh, running in a VM, and we're in the process of migrating to the one that's actually managed by the Cloud Foundry platform. So you can see there, there's one of our basic um, just queues that we have up there. The other thing that's very challenging at Gap, and this is probably not unique to Gap, is data. We have a lot of different data sources. We have every database in the book. And it's a real challenge to start new projects, develop new capabilities, when we have to deal with a lot of legacy DB2, even mainframe type of databases. So we've used a tool called Denodo. And Denodo is a data virtualization platform. And what that basically allows you to do is to expose a view on a table or a group of tables or through a join uh, query as a REST service or accessible through you know, JDBC or one of those normal type of database access technologies. And the nice thing about Denodo is it allows us to make very disparate sets of data 
look the same. We can do some basic stuff there. We can do some basic aggregations. We can add columns. We can change names. We can do that type of stuff. Um, it's not an ETL tool. Denoto, the real value proposition is that you're not moving your data from one system into a big cluster somewhere. Your data can remain at rest at the system that it currently lives in. Um, and this has been very powerful for us. We've allowed uh, you know, users to really get through their data, to look through it, to examine what's there. Um, it's great for meetings, but it's also great for operational applications when we need to grab this information um, and process it. And that's, that, I think, has been one of the, the really good things for us is this data virtualization capability that we get with Denodo. So auto-scaling. This is my boss's favorite email. He brings it up to every meeting that we go to. And we turned this on, and it was really exciting because for the first time, we had some services that were really getting hammered. And we put an auto-scaler on it, and they just added a couple of new instances for us. And when it was done, it scaled it back down to the normal size. And that's, this is just huge. It really allows us to move quickly, and it allows us to produce services that are much more reliable. Um, and you know, it just, it's, it's just been a great capability for us. The one thing I think that I, I do have some concerns about here is that this is a very reactive scaling model. This observes something that's going on in your VM and it reacts to it. Um, but if you have something like Rabbit, there's a lot of queuing theory out there that a lot of you are familiar with that you could predict we're not about to meet our SLA based on some data and statistics that we have. So why not proactively add some instances? And that's some of the things that we've been talking with Pivotal and others about is how we could achieve that capability. Um, but for right now, it's reactive. But, you know, it works pretty well. Um, and this has saved us on, on numerous occasions. One of the other things, um, as you can imagine a place like Gap, very large IT environment, um, many servers, loads of different uh, applications, services, you name it. So we really needed to buy um, an application performance monitoring tool. And PCF didn't offer a whole lot in this um, current release for us. You know, there's not the thing that we use both AppDynamics and New Relic. And I put a, a screenshot up here in New Relic. <clears throat> this is, you know, great to monitor all of your tools, to really get some insight into what's going on. Uh, a couple of my developers came to me and they said, gee, why is this taking, you know, 20 seconds? It normally takes one. And we were able to go through all the way down to the actual query that was being run in the Mongo database. And it just wasn't using the index because somebody had changed it. So it was a real quick, easy, proactive change. And these tools were really, really good to help us uh, diagnose and deal with those kinds of problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the other things about buying a tool like this is that it works across the rest of your infrastructure, not just PCF, because we have loads of legacy services running VMware and OpenStack and, you know, you name it. So it's nice to be able to install this agent and to get a very uh, comprehensive view of your environment and to be able to look across your different services and areas and to see where problems might be happening or things that you might need to look at. Um, this has been a great capability for us. The other thing is logging. I, I noticed at the conference a lot of people have mentioned that they're struggling with logging um, and that you know, it's nice to have a solution. Well, we bought Splunk. And Splunk is heavily used. Last time I checked, we have about 60 terabytes of logging data. Um, and yeah, it's quite a lot. But what we've set up Cloud Foundry to do is, by default, all of the logging information for any deployed service goes automatically to Splunk. So if you're a developer, you're not aware that it's happening. Um, it just happens out of the box. And that's been a great capability for us. You can do a lot with Splunk. Um, it's more than just looking at logging messages. It sort of overlaps maybe just a little bit with some of the APM offerings. So if you see in this example here, We've got some errors in one of the applications um, that optimizes essentially packs of shirts. So it's nice to be able to build these dashboards, share these dashboards, and to get a very uh, comprehensive look at what's going on in your application. You can also look across applications and do correlations. So it's been a really, really good tool for us. 
Uh, most apps have their own dashboard. And then, of course, you know, there's the alerting, right? If something goes wrong, it's pretty easy just to set an alert up and get an email or what have you. So, you know, those are some of the really good things. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we've had and how we'll address them, or how we did address them. One of the things with Spring Cloud Config, I, I saw this, oh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, something like that. And it, it's a really good idea. It really allows us to scale applications quickly, add new instances, and manage a lot of complexity um, in a very nice way. But it does have uh, you know, a few issues. One of them is there's hand encryption, right? If I want to encrypt that key or that value, I have to put that in Git encrypted. I have to think about doing that. I have to manage that password somewhere. There's no real rotation of those keys. And there's not a great way to um, administer that from sort of an enterprise point of view. And then also, Git becomes a single point of failure for all of your applications. That's not great. Git is usually really reliable. I don't think I've ever seen it go down. But um, you know, if it does, everything stops. And that's not a great design. There's also, uh, with the blue-green deployments, there's some complexity uh, with that when you have to deal with webhooks. So you know, it, it, it's a good idea, um, and it's going to get there. But it's not quite there yet. Um, and one of the other things I think that we've had trouble with is that the audit trail that you get with Git <clears throat> tells you when someone committed a change, but it doesn't tell you when that change was actually deployed and effective in production. And in some of our environments, you can imagine we deal with uh, personally identifiable information. There are really specific regulations that we need to follow and reports that we need to generate and substantiate that a change went in um, and all those types of things. So Spring Cloud Config is a good idea, but there are some things that need to be um, improved. We took that to Pivotal, and they've been great. And they said, you know, you're right. Um, why don't you guys not solve that on your own? Why don't we work together, and we can fix it and then deploy it as part of the platform? So that's coming in a future release. Um, Gap and Pivotal co-developed this capability um, to use console and a few other things to encrypt and maintain this type of a capability. So it's a vault and console. Um, Nivesh, where are you, Nivesh? Nivesh over there, I don't want to steal his thunder. He's going to talk about this in detail in the next talk. Um, so that'll be right here, uh, right after mine. The other thing is sort of IaaS or, or DBaaS or whatever you want to talk, whatever you want to call it. But the idea of getting databases and state for your applications at Gap has been pretty challenging. You know, it's a lot of infra tickets. It's a lot of waiting around. Um, it's a lot of following up and nagging the people to get your database um, set up. It's not a great model, and that really slows us down. So one of the things that we've been piloting is Tesora, which is essentially a commercial version of Trove, which is an open source um, DBaaS capability for OpenStack. So I go in to this interface and I say, you know what, I need a Mongo, I need a Postgres, I need a Cassandra. And then it'll be provisioned automatically and then something that you can use in your application. Now, it's not brokered through PCF, so you still have to use a separate type of an environment. Um, we installed PCF on-prem, so we don't have access to you know, a lot of these things that you might find in the public version yet. So this is sort of a middle-of-the-road offering right now that we have for our developers. Uh, it's pretty good, but one of the concerns that I have is that as we move to a more public cloud type of an environment, how do we replicate this kind of a capability? How do we make it seamless and easy for our developers so that they can rapidly pivot and move their things into the public cloud rather than just having it sit in our data center? Um, but like I said, it's pretty good capability. It has a lot of good offerings. And it's a great API. They have a Python API, so you can easily automate this through Jenkins or any of those types of tools. Um, the other challenge we've had, um, and this was pretty easy, right? But once you go in, if you go into an encrypted endpoint that's hosted in PCF, that's encrypted and that's fine. But the traffic within Cloud Foundry, by default, is not encrypted. And for us, that was a significant issue when we're dealing with people's names, addresses, credit card numbers, what have you. So it was a pretty easy solve here. You can just install this IPsec plugin, and that's pretty much all there was to it. We had a little bug, I think, that we found. But 
that has really hardened the platform and it's made it very ex um, acceptable to our sort of audit and compliance type folks. Well, where are we going next? I, I think one of the big things that we're looking at is migrating to public cloud, so to Azure, to maybe Amazon, maybe not Amazon. Uh, most retailers don't use Amazon because you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to dump money in your competitor's pockets. But um, you know, never say never. So migrating to the public cloud, I think, is going to have a lot of advantages in terms of speed and scale. It's also going to allow us, if we need to, to move our services uh, closer to our users. So we do have users that sit in Shanghai and in Tokyo um, and various other places. So having those services local to those users is going to provide a better experience for them when they use our applications and some of the services there. You know, we get access to a lot of great new technologies. Um, I, I find that not everything has to be in PCF. Um, it's great, it's a great platform, but if there are capabilities out there, um, machine learning, for example, that Azure offers, it's nice just to be able to use those and integrate those easily. So eventually we're gonna start running Cloud Foundry on Azure and we'll deploy our applications out there. And one of the things that Nivesh has been spearheading is Apogee so that we have a secure pathway back to any legacy services that we might need in GAPS data centers. But, you know, we make genes, right? We're not in the data center business. So it makes sense when possible to move some of these capabilities out to the experts. And there are some cost concerns there. You know, some of these services are very cheap at the low end, but if you start to really scale them up, if you look at the cost modeling, that can get really expensive really fast. So that's one of the things that we have to look at and consider when we're building and deploying our applications is what's that cost going to be when you go to the public cloud and we have a big project kicked off to sort of characterize that and figure out the right way. So that's, that's really all I had. Um, any questions? Sure. Yeah, so the question was, you know, how has PCF improved our ability to deliver quickly? Um, and, you know, we found a dramatic improvement. In the old way of doing things, we configured everything through Chef, we built servers, um, we had sort of this dodgy build system. You know, it really could take weeks to get a feature into production. Um, and now with this tool set that we have, along with this CI CD capability, that really has accelerated that. So, you know, we could really push something in five minutes. I mean, yeah, it's been a dramatic improvement for us. Yeah. And it, it developers love it. You just, you, you click the commit button and there you go. Right. It's, it's really, really nice. Any other questions? So a couple out here. Sure. Right, so question is, you know, we run PCF on-prem, and have we considered installing some of these publicly available tiles and other capabilities? We have, you know, we're pretty open to doing that. Um, there are just a lot of security requirements that we have. So running something in the public cloud right now, um, people just are a little gun shy, I would say. So, you know, we'll get there. Um, and we have installed some of the other things, but it's, it's not a slam dunk for us to do that. Other questions? Sure. You mentioned that your production has like a few like touch points. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So the question was why do we have this sort of human stop before we flow stuff through to production? Generally we want to have a little bit of control about what goes into that production environment. Um, not I think that we're concerned about people doing something sort of nefarious, but we don't want to change so rapidly that our users are confused. 
So if you walk in and your UI is totally different uh, this morning versus what it was last night, that's not a great user experience there. And there's also just a little bit of um, just sort of cultural change in our organization that we need to go through. If we just rapidly push stuff through without giving someone an ability to look at it, in some contexts, not all, but in some contexts, that's a little bit of a problem. And uh, we want to be, as we bring this capability forward, we want to be open to those kinds of concerns um, so we satisfy those constituencies. Sure. To Sora, yeah. Right. So the question is, do we look at the provisioning of those databases uh, through Cloud Foundry interacting with Tesora? Um, we haven't looked at it too much. Um, you know, I think maybe that would be a, it would be a nice capability. Uh, Tesora for us is still running sort of a pre-release version of it. So it's still not quite, you know, ready for prime time. Um, but it's getting there very rapidly. Question. Sure, sure. So question is, how do we do CI, CD so we can get this, you know, weeks to five minutes deployment? You know, we looked at it and we used to have um, an old legacy tool that did our builds that was very slow, non-standard. And I threw my hands up and I said, guys, we're going to Jenkins. Um, anybody complain, send them to me. And they did. They complained and I had a lot of arguments about it. But Jenkins is just a standard capability. And I look at CI, CD as kind of an enabling capability. But beyond that, I don't care too much about it, right? I just need my stuff to build and deploy. And that's really been key for us. We've also kicked off another initiative we call FedCI, which is essentially a Jenkins instance that we've configured, we've integrated with some sort of security with console and a few other things. And it runs in Docker, so people can actually run it on their laptops anywhere they want. Um, it's been, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good capability, but like I said, um, you know, I, don't, I just need it to build and deploy. I'm less concerned about the Fed CI or the CI CD capabilities, but it is very important, right? It is a very important enabler for us. Sure. Do your development team have their own Jenkins pipeline, or do you uh, provide some sort of common Jenkins pipeline to sure. for everybody to push it? Yeah, so how do we handle pipelines is the question. Or just like <clears throat> No, most teams have their own instance of Jenkins, either running through Docker or running in OpenStack, um, also through, you know, sometimes through Docker there as well. And we found we just want to push all of this to the teams. Um, I think we, as an organization, got a little burned by having a central group that did everything. And my approach is, for my teams, guys, you break it, you bought it, you know, manage it. This is DevOps. You know, do it yourself. And I think teams really appreciate that capability and that ability to do things on their own. Um, so we do have a group that helps. Um, and we actually treat all the pipelines as code. That's probably another thing that I should mention, is that we check in all of those build uh, configuration, that DSL language that Jenkins has. So that way, you know, we can see what's going on. It's easy to manage. It's easy to reuse, those types of things. Sure. What's that? Sure. Yeah, so the question is, how do, we, you know, how do we have sort of quality control? We do a lot of um, testing. We have a lot of unit tests. We have pretty advanced sort of test pyramid at GAP. Not that it couldn't stand a little bit of improvement, but you know, that we have a lot of capability there. And we tend to run different types of tests depending on where things go. A typical pipeline will run some basic unit tests. If that's good enough, it'll check that artifact that's built into Artifactory. And from there, that artifact is sort of put through the paces, um, other integration tests, API level tests, those types of things. Really kind of depends on the project, um, but that's generally how we do it. And then once that is passed, 
it goes into Artifactory again or is moved generally um, to another branch and then deployed automatically. Anything else? Sure. So the question is, you know, how do we do blue-green deployment? How do we work through this with our users? You know, I think we're, we're still learning a little bit there. So I, th I think we probably um, have a few lessons that we need to get through on our own there. But we certainly do blue-green deployment for some of our more critical services. Um, but we're also in a position of moving to PCF, a lot of these types of services. So it is a little bit um, manual at this stage, and there's been a lot of sort of manual configuration, load balancers put in, open stack, on and on and on. Um, but you know, moving to Cloud Foundry really does simplify that kind of a capability. Um, so yeah, I think you know, we, we do it, but we, there's a bit to learn there. Um, we're not the experts yet. Okay, I probably have uh, five minutes left. Anything else? All right, well, if you guys want one, oh, one in the back, sure. The major, what kind of changes? So, uh, interesting question. So, the question is, you know, how do we organize our teams in order to make use of this capability? Typically, what we've done is we've organized our teams around um, sort of domain concepts. So, we have a pricing team. And within that team, there are several squads. So we have a squad that deals particularly with optimization. And the, that group is responsible for a lot of optimization capabilities. So it might be price optimization today. It could be pack optimization tomorrow. So we've organized those teams that sort of stand and have domain capability <coughs> in an area. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's how we've organized those teams. We, you know, two pizza teams, we try and follow that. Um, not always, so I, I think that's a good rule of thumb, but sometimes we just have a little bit too much work. Um, and we also have distributed teams. We do a lot of work with people in Brazil, India, um, Seattle. We have a lot of uh, distribution there, so sometimes that's a little bit complicated. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. If you guys want, thank you.